Jaws 4, Halloween 6, and A Good Day to Die Hard. Three different ways to say nobody's favorite movie. These franchises started out with incredible debuts and ended up as tired jokes. Could, can you stop him talking like that? Is there a switch or something? The first time you see Freddy Krueger, it's the scariest night of your life. The last time you see him, he's like a bad comedian and you want to boo off the stage. How about this, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> Robert Englund's iconic performance as Freddy made a creep who needs some lotion into a horror movie legend. The first movie's success single-handedly established New Line Cinema, which kept the nightmare train going with sequel after sequel. And every one of these sequels was a little bit dumber than the last. You scarface limp dick! The kills get far too silly, and Freddy's backstory as the son of 100 maniacs starts to become something only a maniac could understand. It's still one of the greatest horror franchises, and Freddy has a spot on the Mount Rushmore of slasher villains right next to Jason Voorhees and Thomas Jefferson. But New Line's determination to wring every last dollar out of the franchise drained this monster of its power. I just keep on ticking. The last new movie in this series was a 2010 reboot that brought nothing to the table but things we've seen before. The original Die Hard is one of the greatest action movies ever made, and its sequels are things that exist. Die Hard 2 started the Die Hard but in a blank trend by doing Die Hard but in an airport. The third movie is an inspired buddy romp through a Manhattan-wide string of action sequences, but after that the whole thing fell off a cliff. The first three diehards are relatively grounded for action movies. Bruce Willis may be fighting on the wing of a plane, but if he falls off, he's definitely gonna die. By the fourth movie, he can just kill planes. She just killed a helicopter with a car. How's that a bullet? It's bad enough when Black Widow can somehow survive concussive impacts that should shatter every bone in her body. At least she's an Avenger. But John McClane is no superhero. He's a schlubby, tired cop who happens to be in the right place at the wrong time. In the first movie, shards of glass on the floor are a serious problem. By the fifth one, John is all but immortal. A poor man's Captain America who's lost all of his charm. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Speaking of normal people who become completely unkillable. I don't have friends. I got family. Everyone knows the arc of the Fast and Furious movies. They started out being about street racing and simple heists. The DVD players were purchased legally. All we've got on Tran and company are some outstanding speeding tickets. Five movies in, they became movies where literally anything could happen. We're gonna need a bigger truck! It started out as great fun, but by the eighth movie, things became not so fast and way too serious. The era of literal superhumans and launching cars into space we're out of space! Should have seen the series at its most wacky, but now they feel bloated, like they've taken too many steroids. Much like the runway in Fast and Furious 6, movies in the series have become impossibly long. They're also incredibly expensive. In fact, Fast X costs so much to make Here we go. that it was a box office disappointment, despite bringing in well over half a billion dollars. Much like Die Hard, Jurassic Park is a legitimately great movie with a lot of sequels it doesn't need. Following the first film's meteoric success, Universal Studios mined more fossil fuel with the Lost World Jurassic Park and Jurassic Park 3. Alan. Neither film came anywhere close to the quality of the original. The series went dormant until Chris Pratt, perhaps the most mid of Hollywood Chris's, brought his hoorah charm to Jurassic World. Essentially a remake of the original movie but with 100% more Jimmy Buffett, this new entry in the franchise was a runaway hit. It spawned two sequels, neither of which were well received by critics. Jurassic World? Not a fan. Jurassic World Dominion in particular had a bizarre plot about dinosaur preservation, genetically modified children, and giant locust swarms. And yet, it still managed to break a billion dollars at the box office. Shame about the 29% on Rotten Tomatoes, though. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. No one really thinks of Jaws as a slasher movie, but the sequels somehow have the worst versions of every slasher trope. They made Leprechaun in Space look like The Godfather Part 2. 
Steven Spielberg's 1975 thriller was a massive hit and redefined what it meant to be a summer blockbuster. Universal seems to have a thing for taking classic films and diluting them to the point of parody, and the Jaws franchise might be the worst offender. Bloody hell, you get us started double the breath on that thing. Though it could be argued that there are legitimate fans of Jaws 2 out there somewhere. Jaws 3D and Jaws The Revenge can only be watched ironically. The fourth and final movie in the series is definitely the most baffling. If a killer shark isn't wild enough, Enough, try one with psychic abilities and a serious grudge. I have one simple request, and that is to have sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. There would be no slasher movies without John Carpenter's Halloween. There would be movies about people killing people, sure, but Michael Myers' first massacre laid the groundwork for an entire genre. The original Halloween is great, and Halloween 2 is perfectly fine. But depending on who you ask, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, is either a morbidly funny gem or a stain on the series' name. Instead of Michael Myers, the villain of the third movie is an Irish warlock who wants to turn kids' heads into bugs. I do love a good joke, and this is the best ever. A joke on the children. After that bombed, fans demanded the return of Michael Myers. But you know what they say, be careful what you wish for. With Halloween 4, the return of Michael Myers, the single-minded serial killer was back and more generic than ever. It also started a never-ending trend of retcon story arcs. Wasn't it her brother? No. That's just a bit that some people made up. When executives decided to wash their hands of Michael's convoluted past and start fresh, there was apparently no one better to direct than the man who invented slamming in the back of the Dragula. Rob Zombie helmed two Halloween films in the late 2000s, giving Michael a white trash backstory. And when David Gordon Green took over a decade later, he just threw everything that wasn't Carpenter's original completely out the window. There's nothing to learn. There are no new insights. At this point, the Halloween timeline is about as simple as AP Calculus. Even though the series supposedly ended in Halloween Ends, the entire Halloween franchise has become a stalking menace that no one seems capable of killing for good. Decades before Brendan Fraser won an Oscar for getting sweaty in a fat suit, he battled an undead Egyptian priest in the reboot of Universal's The Mummy. This wasn't your mummy's mummy either. Emotep remains a scary villain to this day, provided you stop following the story at the end of the first movie. The 1999 Mummy movie made a boatload of money, but the sequels couldn't avoid falling into all of the typical pitfalls. In The Mummy Returns, the scariest thing on screen was Dwayne The Rock Johnson, looking like a character from Mortal Kombat, on the PlayStation. Too. After that, there was nothing Tomb of the Dragon Emperor could do to save the sinking ship, and the series was pushed into obscure direct-to-DVD Scorpion King spin-offs that were doomed to haunt bargain bins and Walmarts across America. Universal attempted to bring the franchise back with the Tom Cruise-starring reboots that kicked off the Dark Universe. And that's right, the Dark Universe, the beloved cinematic universe that includes a remake of The Mummy and literally nothing else. We'll never get to see Russell Crowe in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but judging by the sad attempt to resurrect The Mummy for a quick buck, it doesn't seem like a massive loss. Unless, of course, you're Russell Crowe. It's not an exact science, this business. And the business being evil. Horror movies don't get much better than Alien, and action movies don't get much better than Aliens. However, many movies are better than Alien 3, and Alien Resurrection, and Alien Covenant. So where did things first go wrong? Alien 3, or as some call it, Alien Cubed, was stuck in development hell for ages, with writers and directors entering and exiting like it was a revolving door at Applebee's. They eventually landed on a rookie filmmaker by the name of David Fincher, who was still a few years away from making an actually decent movie. Alien 3 made its way to cinemas in 1992, but it immediately drew criticism by killing off two fan-favorite characters within the first five minutes. The series had a brief creative revival when Ridley Scott returned with Prometheus, which ended up being Alien without the Alien. When the Xenomorph as we know it finally did make its dramatic return in Alien Covenant, Scott was still so stuck on the philosophical plot lines of Prometheus that it felt like a chore to watch. Despite the past 30 years of Alien flops ruined by the never-ending quest for profit, some fans still hold out hope that Fede Alvarez's upcoming Alien flick, Alien Romulus, might actually be good. Ridley Scott says that he loves what he's seen, but then again, he also loved putting Guy Pearce in freaky old man makeup. Very negative way of looking at things. Exactly why you should have stayed at home. 
When Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones first put on the suits and sunglasses for 1997's Men in Black, success seemed all but guaranteed. In the years since, studio executives have tried to recapture the magic, but it seems they've looked directly into the neuralizer and forgotten what it is that actually made the original so good. In an interview with Den of Geek, Men in Black screenwriter Ed Solomon gave his take on what makes Men in Black so special, saying, I always felt like the secret to Men in Black was not the sunglasses and the big guns and the coolness, and the other surface-level coolness of it. I always thought the secret of Men in Black was the generosity of spirit. Unfortunately, all the things that didn't define the original for Solomon became the franchise's identity, and it started to flounder with its sequels. The series had the potential to take a big swing when it was announced that it could be crossing over with 21 Jump Street, but the project ended up getting canned. Instead, we got the incredibly mediocre Men in Black into National, the second worst Thor Ragnarok reunion, just behind Love and Thunder. <laughs> Unless the next one finds a way to bring back Vincent D'Onofrio's fan favorite alien Bugman, we've probably seen all we need to see of Men in Black. Uh. Is that letter? James Cameron is probably the closest thing we have to a real-life wizard. He creates magical worlds and bends the box office to his will, so naturally his Terminator series fell apart when he moved on. The Terminator introduced millions of people to Austrian strongman Arnold Schwarzenegger as a terrifying killer cyborg, and Terminator 2 Judgment Day changed up the formula by turning him into a terrifying killer cyborg that you could trust to watch your kid. Both films were smash hits that massively multiplied their budgets. T2 made over half a billion dollars on a budget of around 100 million dollars, and that's not counting all the kids who snuck into the theater after paying for Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Check this out! After that, Cameron was done directing the series, so he moved on to big boats and cat people. Of course, Fox couldn't let such a big earner go unexploited. Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines was the beginning of the end, but at least it actually had Schwarzenegger in it. The same couldn't be said for Terminator Salvation in 2009, which was when the movies truly started to feel like cash grabs. Even Arnie couldn't save the series when he came back for Terminator Genesis. You ass. James Cameron returned as a producer for 2019's Terminator Dark Fate, but the newest sequel came nowhere close to the first two films. So you're Carl. That's what everyone calls me, yes. It seems that any possibility for the series to return to its former glory has been squashed. What? You think I was going to say terminated? You're wrong. You're terminated.